Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Mary Rong for inviting me to be uh, a moderator on this esteemed panel. Uh, Mary, you said you had an admin announcement. I for and I forgot to tell you. I'll just say it. Um, <laughs> this, we don't know if this went all the way around or not. It has the email list. It's back here. Okay, so it's going around when you're done. Bring it up so we're going to get a copy. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, we uh, are going to give 15 minutes to each of the panelists, and we are going to go in the order of the program, the way it's printed, and the names and, and the order in which they're printed. Um, I will not read any biographies that are already printed, so uh, I will just uh, uh, mention the names and keep time rather strictly. <laughs> All right, so we begin with Ms. Nicoletta, Nika. Uh, Srimak, and then next will be Jolyn Shoemaker, and then Benjamin Lowellet. So, Nika, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Alvia. Thank you so much to Mary for inviting me to this conference and for your mentorship, and for everyone, for everything I've learned from all of you um, so far, and will continue to. In December 23, 1990, Slobodan Milosevic, former leader of Serbia's Communist Party, uh, won the Republic's presidential election by a landslide of 65% of votes, um, together with the Socialist Party of Serbia, which won 194 out of 250 seats in the National Assembly. And at the time, there were questions about voting irregularities. Uh, there were concerns about the fact that the governing party already held virtual control of the media and television. And the country was on the brink of a civil war that would leave thousands dead and millions displaced. But what is the one question that no one thought to ask at the time about that pivotal election? How many women were elected to those parliamentary seats? Just 1.6%, or 4 out of 250 seats uh, in Parliament, which was one of the lowest rates in the world that year, and certainly the lowest rate in Europe by far. Why was that rate so low, and why did that coincide with the early stages of Milosevic's takeover and the beginning of the country's civil wars? Those were the first questions I sought to answer when I started researching Serbian women's political participation from the 90s and earlier until today, and how this coincides with WPS in the country and in the region. So again, my name is Nicoletta Streamak. I work and study at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where I was given the opportunity to do this research on Serbia, directed by Ambassador Swanihan um, at the Kennedy School in Inclusive Security. I was born in that country that no longer exists, Yugoslavia, from which my family emigrated uh, during the civil wars of the 90s. And I'm lucky enough to actually have my parents with me here today. Um, and <laughs> I'm just so grateful that they could be here because um, it, of course, wasn't if it wasn't for their brave sacrifice in uh, leaving their home country during the wars, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn from this perspective, nor to be, be with you here today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm here to present some of the findings of a short paper, which I submitted for this conference, which you can read in the Working Paper series. And this came out of a longer research project over the past few months, where I've conducted a series of interviews with representatives from Serbian government, um, from civil society, from external NGOs that work in the region, like inclusive security and citizens of other sectors who were involved in activism against the regime during the 90s or who have immigrated since then and have stakes in the country's situation of gender equality. And as Lema Bowie reminded me last night in her incredible speech, this is not important just as a case study that we can take away, but also for us to amplify these women and men's voices that are doing incredible work there and um, hopefully find ways to directly support them. So that's what I will try to do. I'll give you a bit of a background and context of Serbia's gender integration process and why this topic matters to all of us. I'll then give you three main takeaways from my interviews and I'll show, also share some quotes and stories. Um, this is ongoing research, so I look forward to any comments and questions. In my mind, Serbia is one of the most fascinating places we can look at as scholars and practitioners of WPS because it represents this convergence of hyper-masculine, nationalist, aggressive, macho political mentality taking over and exactly corresponding with a drop in female official political participation. But also a case where women have been participating and organizing, whether formally or informally, in an almost paradoxical contrast 
to that political mentality, and I'll explain more of what I mean by that. I don't think I need to convince this group why the issue of women's political and security sector participation is so crucial to peace, but I will say it again, uh, because why not, and especially in light of our theme of amplifying the WPS agenda, that in the Balkans and all over the world, we cannot hope to prevent future conflicts, nor to state, safeguard a stable democracy without the full participation and empowerment of women. And there's so much evidence demonstrating this. For example, again, the study that was mentioned um, that specifically found that as the percentage of women in parliament increases by just 5%, and again, in Serbia we were talking about 1.6%, um, a government is five times less likely to use violence when faced with an international crisis, and the same trends are true for civil wars as well. I also know that in the 2000s, 90% of conflicts occurred in countries already afflicted by, the, by war, so the rate of relapse is extremely high, and uh, peacekeeping efforts have been shown to succeed in the short term, but often to fail in the long term. So all of this is critically relevant for Serbia, which is a country fairly recently out of a horrific civil war and peace process with definitely still present tensions and violence within, with the sur surrounding countries, as well as the various ethnic groups within its borders. And we absolutely need to be paying attention to the degree of women's empowerment within Serbia and the region of the Balkans as an indicator of its prospects for lasting peace. A little bit of country background. After Milošević's ouster in 2000 and the end of the conflict period, as um, Laura Hoover's study showed yesterday as well, this was definitely an opportunity in Serbia for major democratic changes as well as, um, of course, security sector reform and gender reform, uh, such as early um, integration of the country's police, security, and military forces. And these reforms happened thanks in large part to really active civil society organizations, many of which came out of anti-war protest movements of the 90s. Um, and it's important to note that in Serbia and ex-Yugoslavia, women were really the drivers of creating a civil society, as well as a lot of peace building during and post-conflict, though of course they were left out of the official peace negotiations. So again, thanks in large part to these organizations, the country passed its first national action plan for UNSCR 1325 in 2010, and very excitingly, Serbia's second NAP has just been approved by the cabinet. Um, and Serbia's NAP is unique in that it's housed in the Ministry of Defense uh, rather than other more traditional, mini traditional ministries such as gender ministries or ministries of the interior. And it really focuses on security sector integration, which has actually been um, one of the criticisms from some sides that it's kind of narrowly focused on security sector. Um, in 2012, during the parliamentary elections of that year, a gender quota system was also introduced that required a third of all candidates uh, to be women. And as we know, that's the best way to ensure that they are elected. So they were elected to 84 out of 250 seats that year, therefore dramatically increasing their political participation uh, over 20 years since that awful 1.6%, what is now 34% of seats in parliament, which is one of the highest rates in the world. So that's, of course, very exciting, but there's also so much more to look into um, in the story of gender, peace, and security in Serbia. My first takeaway from researching the Serbian case relates to the importance of understanding the specific ways that women are exercising power within a particular society, whether it's formal or informal, in the various roles that are available to them, uh, beyond looking at just the numbers of women in parliament, for example, as an indicator of likelihood to implement gender reforms. Uh, in Serbia's case, there's a legacy of gender equality that stems from the post-World War II communist period uh, lasting until the late 1980s, where after World War II, women were actually rewarded for their participation in the fight against fascism and the rebuilding of the country with equal rights, uh, including in education, equal pay, and even politically within the party, holding some important positions. This legacy of participation is something that respondents told me is often not recognized from abroad. And the rise of Milosevic in the late 80s is remembered as coinciding with male-dominated suppression overtaking political life. But as one former member of parliament, Milica Delevich, pointed out, there was a difference between, quote, a formal way of wielding power and informal way of wielding power where many women who were wives of male politicians were actually political, able to be political leaders in their own right. And importantly, again, there was these very strong 
women-led grassroots protest movements, including by the well-known Women in Black, which has um, organized more than 500 anti-militarism protests um, in the region. And this represents, again, an almost paradoxical contrast to this macho political mentality of Milosevic, which emphasized women's roles as only carriers of the nation and sort of passively providing soldiers and support. Um, this legacy is therefore key to understanding the current situation and how representation has risen so high. It has actually historically been so high, though in different ways over time. Another theme that came up in my interviews was the importance of external actors and processes in influencing the WPS agenda, both in positive and negative ways. Um, Serbia's political joy, goal of joining the European Union, for example, has bolstered prospects for reform by contributing funding, um, by having gender, uh, inclusion provisions in their accession criteria, and um, through measurements and indicators such as the EU Index for Gender Equality, which Serbia was the first country outside of the EU to adopt. However, other respondents have negative perceptions on the relationship between these two goals, telling me that gender inclusion is a priority pushed onto the country by external actors, uh, and that there is a lack of political buy-in um, from the government, which only uses these goals as tools to gain funding or favor in the U.S. session talks. One other factor is, I think, a somewhat common perspective that external actors often tell Serbia to approve um, or to take on these priorities without really acknowledging their continuing struggles as a nation, um, such as economic disparity, ethnic tension, and continuing ongoing political turmoil. Um, there's a feeling that the entire country has been continuously villainized by the rest of the world, which results in a distrust of foreign intervention that can slow progress. One interviewee, Natasha Kisinesh, a former student protester and current social worker, said, and I quote, there is so much blame and shame put on these people. So unless you acknowledge that suffering and pain, you cannot start having these conversations with people about helping others. People have to say, this is what happened to us, and this is what we need to do for others. My final takeaway is the different roles of structural versus uh, cultural change, where in Serbia's case, there have been many structural improvements that are important, but there's still very traditional patriarchal cultural norms in especially the home and workplaces, which can prevent these advances from being taken seriously and implemented. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One, as I mentioned, the quota system, which we passed and benefited women, like Milica Delavic I mentioned, who shared that she never would have been ranked so highly on the uh, party's list, but because it needed to be every third candidate was a woman, they actually had to look for women to, that could take it on into list, and she got in that way. However, Sofia Mandic, who is a researcher at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, told me that, quote, MPs have accepted the quota amendment as the necessary evil and not out of a true understanding uh, that the underrepresented gender should increase their presence minimally in the parliament, end quote. She said that often women are forced to vote uh, following the party command and not according to their own priorities, and that there's a common belief that they're taking away seats from more qualified men. Uh, a women's parliamentary network was also formed again structurally to promote women in politics and try to promote, propose joint amendments that address women's issues, uh, women's issues. Um, but there is often, unfortunately, a culture of competition and aggression towards one another within that network that prevents it from being as supportive as possible. Uh, as a final example, and another legacy of communism, the country officially has an extremely generous parental leave policy, uh, which is, again, another legacy of the communist times. Uh, that has remained. But another respondent, um, Isabella Srimak, experienced this right being completely disrespected by her male boss, who threatened her into continuing to work for him um, even while on maternity leave as a first-time mother. So even when these policies are in place, they can be abused if workplace culture does not take women's rights seriously. In conclusion, even with these challenges, as now a third session of parliament contains a higher percentage of women, and as they are increasingly represented, uh, slowly in departments that were previously considered male domains, such as defense, police, border security, and infrastructure, um, cultural norms are beginning to change. As uh, Mickey Yachevich of Inclusive Security told me, quote, as somebody who has lived through that war, I just don't buy the narrative that nothing's working in Serbia. 
I lived through nothing is working. But what I do see is when I go to Leskovac and 100 men and women show up to talk about security through a gender lens, that came out of something. I always say I'm more curious about why these things work. Clearly in Serbia there is a lot that is working and that we should pay attention to, especially considering their recent history and the continuing struggles they face. So I would like to leave you on that optimistic feeling about Serbia, and I hope to continue learning from these activists and leaders and amplifying their voices. Thank you. Mika, thank you. Uh, perfect timing. Thank you very much. Uh, Jolyn, you're next. I don't know if I can do perfect timing, but <laughs> um, thank you, thank you all um, for being here today. Well, I'm I'm excited today to be um, uh, presenting uh, initial um, thoughts from a study that I'm doing. Um, with Sahana Dharmapuri here um, for um, our secure future, women make the difference. Um, since uh, December 2016, we've been conducting interviews and uh, surveys uh, with uh, men from across sectors uh, who are engaged in the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, champions of gender equality in peace and security or experts themselves on these issues. Uh, we've talked to over 50 men um, uh, with the survey. We've probably corresponded uh, in different ways with over 75 men. Uh, from the U.S. government civilian side, from the U.S. military, from other governments, from other militaries, civil society, and international organizations. It's a sample, obviously. Um, uh, it's meant to be a first step, really, for us to gather some views from that side of the population that we seek to engage more. Um, we thought that we needed to talk to men who were already involved and already cared about this issue in order to better inform our policy, research, and advocacy, which is so often directed towards advocating um, towards, towards this community. So, so really the central, uh, one of the central questions and, and a lot of the themes that I'll be uh, touching upon um, in my presentation won't be new or shocking to any of this audience. Um, but we really did ask, you know, what, what is men's role in women, peace, and security? Do men matter in women, peace, and security? Especially since there are so many misperceptions um, around that that um, seem to be obstructing men's full engagement in the agenda. So women, peace, and security obviously presents an opportunity to make peace processes and security structures more inclusive, effective, and sensitive to the capacities and needs of the entire population. Men are critical partners in this endeavor, and we need to realize that men can both move this agenda forward, but also obstruct this agenda, because they are dominant in peace and security structures and processes. So if we are going to get to the transformational change that Resolution 1325 and Women, Peace, and Security envisions, we can't do it without men's involvement. So we talked to this uh, uh, swath of, of men who are involved um, to get their views, and um, this kind of represents what they said to us. Um, so the first thing is men can be messengers for this agenda, and what men told us who are involved is that they can, they can be strong messengers, um, often turning the gender, the gender issues on, on their head. The fact that men, if men talk about this agenda, it is often given more weight, more credibility than women talking about the agenda. And that's a sensitive topic for the men who are involved in this agenda. They, they don't feel great about that, but in order to help the, ish, uh, the agenda move forward, um, they're, they're willing to use that strategic, um, that strategic advantage. 
Um, we also, uh, uh, which won't be a surprise to any of you, found that men who did come from the military and traditional defense backgrounds felt that they could convey added credibility talking to these, uh, these um, constituencies um, because they have that credibility in the both policy side um, and or operational side. And they can be bridge builders, um, an important role um, between the traditional security, national security environment and communities and the, and the civil society um, if they are able to work between those. Um, however, the men we talked to were also cautious. They said, you know, we can play a role. We want to be allies. We want to help this agenda move forward. But don't pay too much attention to engaging us. <laughs> we don't want to dilute the women, peace, and security agenda. We don't want to take over the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, there should not be preference for men um, getting, getting these positions, as I think you mentioned, the glass elevator. Um, let's keep it in perspective. But, um, but we, we, do, we do feel that we have a role to play. So how are men supporting women, peace, and security right now? Well, I mean, I think we know from this environment, from being in this conference, some of that. Um, but, but men have usually been the targets of, of our advocacy in, um, um, in, this, uh, in this movement rather than the advocates themselves. Um, that's slowly changing. Um, but our study shows that for many men who have become champions or more heavily involved in this agenda, it's still a fairly new agenda to them. Um, most that we talked to had, um, well, 50, more than 50% um, had become aware of women, peace, and security in the last five years. So it is still fairly new um, and fairly recent for many of them. And many of our military interviewers had, um, interviewees um, had only heard of it very recently. Um, and, and they also told us that uh, the National Action Plan in the US, but the National Action Plan in other countries um, had opened up a lot more space for them to, to, um, to understand this agenda and, and be a part of it. And um, men were observing increasingly men and women working together towards it. So one of our, um, I think our key, um, our key themes that came out of this that I think is really, really important um, is that the men that we talk to really see this as a redefinition of security. And what was interesting is we saw that across the interviews. Um, uh, this wasn't just uh, talking to civil society representatives. It was also um, military representatives as well. Um, so, so interestingly enough, this is this is really this really shows that that the men who are getting fully engaged in this agenda are getting what 1325 and Women, Peace, and Security is truly about. Women, peace, and security emerge from an understanding among civil society that our current structures and processes just are not working, that they're exclusionary and they're not tapping into the rich knowledge and experiences and needs on the ground. And the men we talked to from across the, the sectors um, seemed to realize this wasn't just a, um, a mandate-driven or a rule-driven agenda. This is actually a transformational agenda. And, and they focused on that potential um, in the interviews. They also acknowledge that current processes and structures are not providing peace and security for much of the world right now. And that this agenda actually offers a chance for deep structural and social change. We can change how we view the world and we can change how we approach these issues. And the men that we talked to said they acknowledge the progress that we have made with the mandates, with the integration so far in our structures. But they also said we now need to, as we think about going into the next decade, move, we have the mandates in place, we have much of this rule-based architecture in place. Now we really need to move into norm changing. 
and we've talked about this in, in other panels um, throughout this conference. You know, they said this symbolic high level attention on women, peace, and security is important, but not sufficient. Um, we can't just add women to the existing structures. It's a misrepresentation of what this agenda is. The goals are to transform the perspectives, the processes, and institutions. We need to include women, but it is not all of it. Um, and, and they were hopeful in a way that even though we are facing tremendous uncertainty in the world today, these challenges that are so difficult for us to grapple with, with our current processes, um, our current structures, that in a way our current security environment, the instability, the terrorism, the scarcity, the food, the food security, all these issues that are challenging us to think in new ways are actually an openness, uh, an opening for this agenda. Um, and an acknowledgement, even among our military interviewees, military force can't solve these underlying issues. And so we need to start changing the way we think about social constructs and behaviors if we're ever, ever going to address these problems sufficiently. So across interviews, one of the, well, really men said, okay, what's the biggest obstacle to move this agenda forward? And it is by far organizational cultures and leaders, resistance from leaders. These are the greatest impediments we now face to women, peace, and security. And they also said even in their experience, coming from their standpoint, obviously they can't speak for and they haven't had the experience of women, um, but from their standpoint, they were seeing pervasive gender blindness in peace and security um, institutions and gender bias. Um, 50% of those that we uh, talked to, probably more than 50% at this point, um, reported that they themselves had seen or experienced or observed instances of directed gender bias against the women, peace, and security agenda. So they do recognize it. So how did they themselves get from not knowing anything about women, peace, and security to becoming champions or experts in, we wanted to know, I mean, this is an important part of the story and it's been mentioned before about the personal. In this case, the personal is political um, because the men we talked we talk to had transformational personal experiences that, that pushed them, that, that made this agenda resonate deeply. So it wasn't institutional push as much as it was they had an experience growing up. They saw something in their early professional careers. Um, military talked about seeing the realities of war, see, or seeing exploitation and abuse. Um, growing up in environments where they, they, they directly experienced gender-based violence in their families or on the opposite side grew up with very feminist and empowered mothers. Um, so we can't, we tend to like to disengage the personal from the professional in the women peace and, I mean, in, um, peace and security. We can't do it, I think, if we're going to engage more people in this agenda. I think we need to tap into that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it really altered their perspectives. And as one one interviewer said, um, once you put on the gender lens, you can't take it off. The world never looks the same. So I'm running out. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, okay, okay. So a couple of things that we heard, you know, in terms of, okay, how do we move this issue forward? First, um, the men we interviewed said, you know, we've got to cultivate champions, right? Uh, we can't dislodge this agenda from, we can't disconnect the internal change that needs to happen in institutions from the external work that we do with partners. We need to, it needs to work together. We need to walk the walk inside our peace and security institutions in order to make the case for women, peace and security um, uh, 
with partner nations and so forth. Um, and to build the competencies, we talked about core competencies the first day, we need to build the competencies and give more people in our institutions the opportunity to engage with this issue, the opportunity to work on women, peace and security. And we need gatekeepers, we need the gender advisors, we need the focal points to make sure it's not lost in the process. We need to address gender norms as a foundation for peace. It's the missing piece. We need to talk about it. We need to open the discussion. We need to talk about masculinities, good and bad. We need to talk about the masculinities that drive conflict, but we also need to talk about the positive masculinities that can help us. We need to talk about feminine, too. So we need to ha open this discussion much more than it's ever been um, before. That's what they're saying. Um, and we need to frame the message. We need to tailor it to people. We need to tailor it. Um, so very careful um, ta tailoring. Bring the local needs and um, solutions to the table. Let's bridge what the local people are saying, men and women, to our policies and to our uh, programs. <coughs> Um, and start to broaden the conversation. Let's bring in business people, let's bring in media, let's broaden this conversation, let's sometimes broaden the framing. What are we really talking about? What's the bottom line here that we're trying to get at? The future of humanity, really. Um, so really, our interviewers felt we were on the cusp of a new phase for this agenda. We, it's time to reflect. That's exactly what we're doing here. Reflect on the body of what we've learned. But now we expand beyond the micro interventions. Now we expand to the structural, the social, these issues that are really important. Security depends on everyone. One of our interviewers said, we are not so much talking about policies. We're talking about human values. We have the capability to change how we see the world. Another said, do we consider women, peace, and security a ceiling or a floor? Because it can be transformative if we see it as a floor. And so that's where I will leave it. And thank you so much. If you're interested in our study, we're not done yet. So please come to me, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you. We will open the floor now to Q&A. Um, yeah, Mary, go ahead. Uh, Nika, I'm curious about how you chose the people you interviewed for your study. I started with uh, connections that I had and um, people that, so I, again, was helped a lot by inclusive security and people there um, who helped connect me with others and um, other like personal connections that connected me with other people so that's part of it just honestly like trying to find people that would be willing to interview be interviewed um and just starting to look at who was really advocating this agenda in in belgrade and in serbian society and it was a lot of these think tanks that are I was surprised by there's so many there are like i don't know dozens of think tanks and civil society organizations. Um, so just looking at the names that were continuing to be repeated and trying to reach out to people. But it was really, uh, I had the most success with personal connection, you know, connections of connections that were able to make sure that I got responses. Um, I would like to get more responses from current members of parliament, um, which was hard for me to reach. Uh, so there are, sectors that I want to hear more from that I haven't been able to, but um, I think really there are so many different, I think all sectors of the society are affected by when peace and security and have opinions about it, so I was not discriminative in who I uh, got opinions from, and I really let the interviews drive my questions and, and continuing research, so again, it's work in progress, and I would like to be more specific moving forward, um, but in the beginning it was really who would talk to me and who had some strong opinions about this topic and who was really working on it. Oh, did I hear it correctly? I was going to ask you if you interviewed your mother, but I hear did I, I did. Hear it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was one of my first Because I would think that would be one of the first interviews you do. Yeah, well again, I think <clears throat> Everyone experiences this. Of course, women in Serbian society had opinions about what uh, my first initial questions were. 
what is the, what are the changes that you've seen in your lifetime, or what are um, what are the um, challenges, and what are the specific situations that you experienced? And um, so yeah, those early interviews with family and family friends um, were really helpful in in driving the further conversations, and also often correcting me and um, you know sort of setting me straight on my initial sort of naive questions and framing of the situation and correcting me to say, no, this was actually much earlier. This was, you know, you know, we don't see the problems this way. We see all of these, this progress that we've been, we've made and sort of really, uh, I had to step back and let the interviews speak for themselves. Okay, thank you. In the back, please. My question is for Jolyn. You talked about how to move the issue forward on WPS and the need to cultivate champions um, working together. Do the men give you any ideas on how to cultivate champions or any suggestions? They acknowledge the difficulty. Right? <laughs> um, but I, I do think um, they, they, they acknowledged that how individual this is, and I think um, on the advocacy side, we felt a lot of pressure to kind of find the magic frame that's gonna, you know, attract people. And and I think the what we got from the interviewees is saying this is really institution specific, but it's individual specific. So it's almost um, to cultivate. Um, more supporters has to almost be done on a one by one to one basis, um, and so. Um, but they did say senior. I mean, as as has been brought up so many times during this conference. I mean, senior leadership, no matter what kind of, not just the military policy side, civilian side, senior leadership plays a really important role, and senior male leadership because it. Let's be honest, it's mostly senior male man leadership plays an important role because having those men speak on this and reinforce the message starts to move that really resistant bureaucracy um, forward. But the missed opportunity oftentimes is the mid-level. The mid-level really needs to be cultivated in these institutions because we, we tend to pay attention to the really senior level. But the mid-level, there are men who really want to work on this, and they're not always getting the opportunity to do so. So I think that's, um, yeah. Thank you all for sharing your um, expertise and presentations. I also have a question for Jolyn, um, building off of what Sheila said, and this is something that came up in the curriculum consortium that we had a few days ago is just the relationship across fields. So how we, what we see in academia parallels what we see in the military. And my question for you, Jolyn, is has there been any coordination or are you familiar with any coordination for what's going on in the corporate world as well? And is there anything we can learn from the, as you said, organizational culture is one of the main obstacles as well as leadership. And I think we've seen a number of high profile stories around the um, toxic cultures that are existing in the corporate world as well. Do you think there are ways to coordinate or things that could be learned across different fields? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a really important point that came up in a several different dimensions. So when we, one thing we asked uh, the men we interviewed is like, you know, how do you frame this issue? Because we wanted to know for an advocacy. And, you know, it came up quite a bit in terms of, you know, sometimes it's effective to, to, to bring in those corporate examples as well, not just limit our examples of why this matters to our own little constituency. So bringing that in. Um, so it came up on that side, on the framing side. Um, but it also came up as like a huge obstacle, our silos. And one of the things is, you know, as we know, I mean, military talks to military, and uh, you know, and and so we're not having that necessarily that cross fertilization. But not just the corporate, but like the smaller business, the small business community in the communities in which we're working, because we had a real cross section of interviewees. So we had interviewees who were at the policy level 
but we also had interviewees who were like in the communities working really deeply in these issues. So it, in a way it was a challenge because they're all speaking at different levels. But I think, you know, from those working in the communities, they said we have to bring in the business people. And then, you know, from those that were really trying to make that high, those higher level arguments, they were also saying we need to, so silos was, I mean, not shockingly, you know, it always comes up, right? But, but you know, so there was um, a lot of attention. How can we build bridges um, between these different communities. And the other thing that came up, you know, uh, some of the men said, if they themselves crossed those disciplines, that was really helpful. So like if they had a military background and then they went into the NGO field, you know, or they had a, you know, they, they crossed those lines themselves, then they could speak the language, they could use the vocabulary strategically and start to build the bridges and still understand the importance of you know, bringing in the civil society and all these things. So, yeah, it came up in a lot of different ways. Thank you. Oh, I, I was just going to um, add to Jill's comment about, uh, you know, how to engage people because one of the feedback that we did get from most men is that this is the first time anybody asked them what they thought about women, peace, and security or how they felt about it or how they got involved in it. And so, we also saw the opportunity of, you know, given that it, that it, they were saying like it's really personal and it's a one-on-one -on -one connection, it's actually creating more opportunities for men to talk to the other men about these issues and what would, what could that look like? It, what kind of, community, not leaving women out, but somehow creating more space or opportunity for men to dialogue with each other. Yeah, I mean, because there were, there was really, I mean, there's been no opportunity for men who are advocating for the issues to share their lessons learned either. So we were trying to at least document, start to document it. And I just wanted to say though, I mean, that's a really important point, but we're not even inviting them to our conferences. You know what I mean? I've been to a lot of conferences over the last few years, and the amount of women that are attending the Peace and Security conferences far outweighs the number of men. So we should start inviting them to be panelists and to come to conferences. Well, one thing that they said was not that they weren't invited, but they themselves were self-censoring because they felt like they didn't want to intrude. Like the more sensitive they are to the agenda, the more they self-censor really? yes. because they feel mm -hmm. like they don't want to intrude on the conversation. So, yes. Yes, I wanted to speak to the question about businesses on um, the global. Speak the Global Business Compact, um, there was a Women Empowering Principles, and I, I, I don't remember which is which, there's a bunch of acronyms, so. but the, the United States created, I believe, the WEP, the Women's Empowering Principles, or maybe the other way around, and then the UN adopted that, and they called it something, so there's two different names, but if you look up the Women Empowering Principles, I believe it's been vetted across um, the international sector for the global, for the, for the business side. So that might be somewhere that we should start. Thank you. Phil, well, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to put this one on you too. Um, so I've had several women bosses. Um, and I, I was curious whether or not you include women in the discussion who basically stand in the way of other women. Uh, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And in fact, as you get into the higher echelon, it's getting just more and more competitive. Um, and I find that I, I have better mentors in men than I do. It's actually come up in other wise studies in <laughs> my previous life. But yeah, no, it did come up, and I think it also came up. So men brought this up, definitely. Um, and and um, it also came up in the context of the, the issue that we can't reduce this to parity. Or we can't reduce this to like just let's shove women in the existing structures and it's all going to turn out okay for women, peace, and security. The forces to conform to those structures and those cultures are really strong. So, especially if you're one of the few. So, you know, it, it, there's all these dynamics that happen, and I think, I think one of the things that was coming out is. We need to peel back these layers a little bit now that we have the baseline rules and the baseline mandates and sort of let's 
we need to start getting into the uncomfortable conversations. And I think that's what people were saying who we interviewed. It might not be comfortable, but we're never going to get to the agenda if we don't start doing the conversations and opening it. And that's one of the pieces, for sure. Great. Mary, if there's no one else, I have another question. Please go ahead. Because I don't want to forget. Janika, I'm going back to you, because I really had two questions for you, but I wanted to make sure everybody um, got to um, ask the panel. But the other question I had in thinking about your study is, since it's kind of a personal thing for you, um, where do you see where do you see this region of the world going with um, peace and security? Have you thought about that as a student, you know, as a grad student, and so forth? Um, where do you think some of the main hurdles are going to be, and do you think it will shift at any time? Thank you. Um, I think I was actually this was one of the corrections I had. I am hopeful about the situation in the Balkans for women, peace, and security. I think there's a lot of actually collaboration within the countries that are working on this, um, where a lot of the like the people doing gender in Serbia or some of the really prominent um, politicians or, or women in government are good friends with their counterparts in Bosnia and in um, well maybe not so much Kosovo but in the other countries. Um, and that was surprising to me a bit. So I think that's really hopeful that, and another thing that maybe we don't recognize enough uh, from here, that we tell a simple story that I mentioned too about tensions and, and um, conflict. And it's really not always the case. There's a lot of collaboration and a lot of synergy. Um, so that makes me really hopeful for the region that um, especially, I think as is so often the case, women and men who are working on these issues see past their their differences um, to work together and I think that's a that's a hopeful thing um, another um, aspect that will be really important moving forward is again all of these organizations and um, civil society groups that are present in ex Yugoslavia uh, where they have been instrumental and um, really driving the effort to pass the National Action Plans and um, to enforce them or, and, and implement them and monitor them um, and produce their own reports on what's happening. But they also are not utilized enough and they're not included enough and I think that's been one of the major challenges with the two, I, I haven't read the second National Action Plan yet, I don't think it's publicly available, but definitely with the first one, that there wasn't enough inclusion of those really local groups and bringing in, I mentioned the, the think tanks that are really prominent and doing a lot of work, but there are also these really local community groups um, that are maybe not as academic or not as formal um, or are sometimes like women in black, I mentioned, more critical and feminist, like, you know, not going to uh, just go with the the flow of what people want to do. So they're left out of the conversation. And I think that if we can listen to them more, both in Serbia and in the region, and include them, um, that's been one of the big successes, is this partnership that has been created in collaboration. And I think, again, that's something that's common of a lot of the national action plans, that they foster dialogue between governments and civil society and other sectors. Um, but it's something that will be important moving forward to continue doing. Jolene, um, I don't mean this in any offensive way, but a syndrome I've seen throughout my life is the bearded cleric syndrome, my words, uh, of having the pretext of being a religious figure, male religious figure, to tell the audience what the role and status of women is according to God. Have you engaged in the bearded clerics uh, and, the, and discussion with them? Because if you don't, their influence on society is going to continue to arguably perpetuate that disparity. And a quick note to Nika, if you wish, we have just a few minutes if you want to ask your parents if they wish to say anything. 
All right, so this is where the caveats for this report come in. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, as you know, I mean, this is a, a huge part of the discussion about engaging men at the local levels, and um, so there's a, there's a work on this ongoing, um, and and we we didn't focus on that. I mean, really, even though the the just like Nika, the interviews kind of drove the content, you know, what people want to talk about. And we were talking to um, civil society representatives that are working on the ground. They tended to focus a little bit more on opening this larger space for discussion, right, about, you know, okay, men who came out of military environments or men, you know, in different segments of society. So there wasn't really that central focus on the religious leaders. Um, so it just didn't it just didn't emerge as much, but it was because I think of the nature of who we talked to and what the projects were more than any sort of sense that it's not being looked at. So um, sort of my way out. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, of course, if my parents would like to say anything as um, immigrants and you know really the the drivers of my interest and work in the subject. Please, I would love to hear from you. Sure. If you'd like, you can use that voice. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabella Srimak, and I am the obviously very proud parent of this young woman. Um, uh, just very quickly, it's been a great joy and great experience to participate in her project and her interests and kind of revisit where we came from and what we went through and what we are building toward. And, uh, you know, remind ourselves that, you know, what, what was the cause of all that and what was the motivation behind it. And doing this project together with her and in, uh, answering her question, it kind of, I realized, it kind of made a full circle for us. Um, close the circle of us leaving our country to provide better opportunities for, we have two daughters, for two young women, and uh, how she found her interest and passion into looking back at that region, and with the gender frame, it's, uh, it's been really kind of brought full circle for me as a mother of two young women, uh, our path and our choices. So I'm very, very uh, grateful for that. Thank you.